we left off, started talking about depression as a decrease in or change in the amount of neurotransmitters, dopamine, um, norepinephrine, or Speaking of call drops, first um, medication we talked about was um, amipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, now we're moving on to serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are by far um, the more popular, more frequently prescribed medications for depression. So that works. As we talked about here, instead of allowing the medication to be recycled into the previous nerve, the um, medication stays within the synapse longer. And this medication works just for serotonin. So the thought if it's more selective, then we would have less worry about different side and adverse effects, especially the cardiac issues we are worried about with the tricyclics. So there are several. The first one was Prozac or fluoxetine. Um, sertraline is the one that is our prototype medication. So that's the one you'll see a star by um, Lexapro and um, Celexa, Citalopram and Escitalopram um, are the newer ones, which are supposed to be even more selective to just serotonin in the central nervous system. So hopefully, um, again, trying to reduce the side effect profile. Um, so sertraline is an oral medication only. It could be a pill or a liquid. If it's given as a liquid, then it should be mixed with another liquid, not just given plain. It will take, again, two to four weeks for the onset of action, and it's difficult to predict with each person because the way and how it binds to protein is different for everybody. So the patient should be told that they're not going to feel the full effects for a while. And again, that means that in that space of time, there's an increased risk of suicidal ideation. Oops. I'm just checking to see if there was a question. Okay. Other issues. Some people will have excessive sleepiness and dizziness, and some people will have more of the insomnia-type symptoms. So depending on how the person tolerates it, they might take it in the morning if they get more of the insomnia symptoms. If they get more sleepy, they should take it at night. There is a risk of sexual dysfunction as well, decreased libido in both sexes and impotence in men. So you have to just be sure, I mean, it's not 100% that that will happen, but be sure that you're people are asking and that there isn't an issue. Um, and again, because it's a serotonin medication, there's a risk of that serotonin syndrome, which can begin with chills and diarrhea, but as it gets more severe, it could cause fever, headaches, um, seizures. So I have to be careful about other medications that are given to the patient that also affect serotonin. The other medication that is not used as often anymore for depression, um, sometimes used for used with people who have depression that's not responding to some of the other medications. This medication is an MAO inhibitor, and instead of it's MAOA, so we talked about selegiline being an MAOB inhibitor, which was inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down dopamine in the synapse. MAOA inhibitors inhibit the enzyme that breaks down norepinephrine in the synapse. So tricyclics affect epinephrine, sorry, tricyclics affect norepinephrine and serotonin. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors only affect serotonin. MAOA inhibitors only affect norepinephrine. So we're trying to increase norepinephrine. So we have an increased risk of those cardiovascular issues, especially for this medication of hypertension that could lead to angina or a stroke. And so you have to be careful with hepatic and renal impairment because they're at an increased risk of toxicity. Fuel chromocytoma is a special type of tumor that can occur on top or near the adrenal gland, and that 
tumor increases the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. So if a person has that tumor, they shouldn't take this medication. And MAOs, MAOIs have many medication interactions. Sometimes because there's so many commercials for drugs, now you may notice when they give all the possible side effects and medication interactions, they'll mention cannot take with MAOIs. Don't take with MAOIs because it has a lot of medication interactions. And it should not be used with the other antidepressants. So that um, prototype medication is called phenylzine because it increases norepinephrine and can increase wakefulness and sometimes like jitteriness. You're supposed to avoid caffeine because MAO is an enzyme that's used in the intestine to break down different foods. If you ingest foods high in tyramine, you might have an increase in blood pressure leading to a hypertensive crisis. Same as when we talked about selegiline, because that's another MAO medication. You have to avoid foods with tyramine, which are aged cheese, smoked meats, beer, wine, chocolate, um, kind of like your state fair menu. And then there are some atypical medications that um, aren't used or depends on who the prescriber is. Wellbutrin or bupropion is a medication that's also used for smoking cessation. This medication, the way that it helps depression is not really well known. It does change electrical activity. Um, duloxetine and venlafaxine or venlafaxine are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So they affect norepinephrine, but just in a different way than the MAOs do. Um, so those are other types of antidepressants. So we're over halfway through the behavior health stuff. What we're going to do now is um, help create or create a study sheet for the seizure medications which is located here on our um, content for Neuro Part 2. It's a seizure medication study guide blank form. And it has the, the traditional um, anti-epileptic drugs with some, this shouldn't be very hard to, to um, fill out, but as a way to kind of organize the adverse effects and rules for administration of these medications. So shouldn't take too long to fill out and upload into the Dropbox, which is listed. Seizure medication study guide Dropbox. So we'll reconvene at 1.30 to finish the medications out. So 1.30. And be sure you do that in order to get full credit for attendance. Okay, so I'll show you um, mine and I will upload it too. And then you can use that blank form for studying um, because these are the types of questions that you might see regarding seizure medications, especially related to their adverse effects. Let me just share my screen here. So those traditional seizure medications are the ones that block sodium channels, so they prevent depolarization, hopefully only in the area where the seizure activity is taking place. All of the not, sorry, all of the traditional seizure medications can cause Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrosis. It's carbamazepine that we have to worry about fluid retention. Bone marrow suppression is carbamazepine and valproic acid. And then the liver toxicity and hepatitis and pancreatitis are valproic acid. And this is just a quick rundown of the rules, PO with food for all of them because there's an increased risk of nausea and vomiting. Alcohol increases toxicity risks for phenytoin. No dextrose when given IV, that'll definitely be a question. Um, they're all pregnancy category D, and phenytoin and carbamazepine 
um, can decrease the effectiveness of birth control pills. Um, there's multiple drug interactions. Valproic acid has the extra rule that you cannot take with carbonated beverages, but you could open the capsules and sprinkle them on food. Um, so those are the kinds of things that would be important to remember for the exam. So we're um, just about done, halfway through with the medications that are used for behavioral health disorders. So we talked about um, anxiety, insomnia, and depression, and now we're moving on to bipolar disorder. And bipolar disorder means that the patient has the symptoms of major depression. So that previous slide that we saw for depression um, five of those symptoms for at least two weeks. So they have periods of depression that, oops, um, followed by um, periods of mania, which is elevated psychomotor activity, um, which for the patient does not feel uh, like a problem. At the time that they're feeling the feelings of mania, they actually might feel really good. They feel like they're better than um, people, very talkative, don't need as much sleep, feel like they're very goal-directed, but there is an excessive involvement in pleasurable activities. So people in mania will sometimes stop going to their job. They might spend a lot of money. They might engage in high-risk sexual behavior and drug use. And so after the mania, when they're in the depression, they have to deal with the fallout from their lives, from the, the things that went wrong when they were experiencing mania. So the treatment is not is mood stabilization. So you want to be able to decrease the mania and the depression. Um, and so the first medication that was developed for the treatment of bipolar disorder is lithium. Lithium is another medication with a very narrow therapeutic range. It's actually a salt. You'll see it's milliequivalents per milliliter, just like we've talked about with sodium and potassium. And, and this particular salt has a relationship with sodium. So low sodium can increase the risk of lithium toxicity. So anything that could potentially lower sodium, like extreme dehydration especially, could, um, or uh, even fluid overload, like you have too much fluid in your body, anything that changes the sodium level could potentially affect the lithium level. Um, and when the lithium level is toxic, the person is at risk for profound hypertension. So that's obviously very dangerous for them to have that. So the main thing about lithium is that it was the first medication that came out for bipolar. It actually does a much better job treating the mania than it does the depression. It has a very narrow therapeutic range and toxicity means circulatory collapse plus that relationship with sodium. Usually, um, lithium isn't the first-line drug, really, for bipolar anymore. Sometimes people who have had bipolar for a long period of time will be on lithium because that's what they were started on originally, or people whose bipolar isn't um, being affected by anti-seizure meds, which the traditional and non-traditional anti-seizure medications work well to stabilize mood. Some of the antipsychotics are also used for this, um, these symptoms too. The next disorder is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. To qualify for this disorder, it should be more than um, you know daydreaming or being minorly disruptive in class. This is a diagnosis in childhood, so it's most children will have some degree of these things at any one time. It should be in excess that they're distractible, not able to remember things or sit still, um, and should be interfering with their school performance um, in order to officially qualify for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It should be diagnosed after having neuropsychiatric testing which is like a day of testing for a child. It's like six hours of tests. 
measuring their ability to focus and concentrate and stuff like that. So um, sometimes that diagnosis is given out prior to um, it really qualifying. It is insane. Emily, I'm not sure what you were... Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a long testing process. I, my daughter um, was having some issues when she was in second grade, and we went through the testing. It was a long time, and her ADHD she was very, very mild, so we opted to not treat her with medication, but rather to try to do some like lifestyle management strategies in the classroom so that she would to help focus her attention and she seems to have grown out of it which is also possible um so but it is a lot if you were officially getting the diagnosis it is a long process that's very true it was a long day for me and i don't have attention deficit disorder um the treatment oddly enough for most people is a stimulant the adhd cns stimulants are the treatment of choice and the prototype for us is Ritalin, which is methylphenidate. Um, Adderall is also a CNS stimulant. Vyvanse is too. The non-CNS stimulant is Stratera, which is sometimes used for adult onset um, ADHD. And there is some debate amongst providers if there's truly adult onset or more likely undiagnosed from childhood. Um, methylphenidate, it always seemed weird to me that you would give a stimulant to somebody that's hyperactive, but what it's supposed to do is um, guide the focus, which it does. So instead of being distracted by absolutely everything around you, you focus on whatever the task is at hand. But just like any stimulant, the biggest issue, especially for children, is it decreases appetite and they can lose weight. Which, you know, depending on how old they are, can be bad for them. Um, and so you should give children drug holidays in order for them to, if especially if they're on the slender side, to increase their ability to eat and to gain weight, to gain, to be a healthy weight. Um, and it's thought that, I mean, this medication is truly to heighten focus during times of like school work, sub type of things that they should probably have drug holidays during breaks and things like that. So they can actually, um, so adults can be prescribed Ritalin, but it's technically FDA approved for children with, um, ADHD. And Stratera is the only drug that has approval for adults with ADHD or adult onset ADHD. So it kind of has to do with what your provider thinks you have. If, if they truly think that you never had ADHD and you got it as an adult, then the treatment should be Stratera. If, they, if it's possible that as an adult, you were diagnosed with ADHD, but you actually had it all along. I think that's why they decide that the um, Adderall or Ritalin are better options. But it really does depend on the provider. It can be given for narcolepsy um, because it's obviously going to keep you awake during the day. So, um, so all of these medications can be given for that. And um, some sort of chemically similar medications can be used for um, can be used for appetite suppression too. CNS stimulants often are. That's why it's hard for kids. That's interesting, Aaliyah. You try you took Ritalin and then as an adult it was different. Did it not work anymore as an adult? Oh, interesting. Um, Vyvanse has other um, things that it's approved for. It's approved for binge eating, um, 
disorder because it is so could it be given to help a patient lose weight um, medications similar to that are given to lose weight not those in particular um, the name they are also stimulant or amphetamine like which is what these are too that's why they're controlled substances um, but they're different medicines that are used for uh, weight loss the other issue is nervousness, insomnia, and hypertension because it's a stimulant. Um, and it is a controlled substance, and there's a risk of dependence, and there's a risk of abuse. I mean, there's a lot of people that will, you know, share their prescription, um, and that can, be, that can be a problem. So is the nervousness, insomnia, hypertension, is that just a side effect, or is that an adverse effect? I depends on how I those are one of those that could be a range so someone could have mild insomnia so they take it in the morning or feel slightly nervous have a small increase in their blood pressure or it could be where they have to stop taking the medication because they're uncomfortable okay so most people and this isn't on the slide when you start the medication you should especially children should be following up with their provider in the beginning to check their weight and growth to be sure that it's not um, bringing their growth curves down too low, which would mean they would need a drug holiday or maybe to change the dosing or go every other day or something. Um, and their blood pressure to be sure they're not becoming hypertensive. And that's actually the, the risks. The risk of appetite suppressants that are similar to these medications is hypertension, tachycardia. So you have to worry about that stuff too. And then the last grouping of medications that we're going to talk about are medications for psychosis. So psychosis is a separation from reality. So you no longer are experiencing the world like other people do. People have delusions, which are ideas or beliefs that aren't real. Hallucinations are things that they experience with their senses that other people don't see, hear, or feel. Um, illusions is distorted perception of stimuli, like if the, you know, if you heard a sound that everyone can hear, so it's not like it's a made-up sound, but it's a sound that everyone can hear. You hear it differently than other people, and very paranoid um, and suspicious. So if someone could have psychosis with any of these mental health conditions this, with mania with anxiety with depression where the they're on the very far end of the spectrum that they have really separated from reality psychosis is a key part to the diagnosis of schizophrenia so it's often the medications for psychosis are often talked about with schizophrenia and some of them were first developed to treat schizophrenia itself because these symptoms of psychosis are part of the symptoms of schizophrenia. They're considered, which is kind of a weird way to describe it, but psychosis is described as the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. They're the symptoms that are added on to normal behavior. People with schizophrenia not only have psychosis they also have very negative symptoms or things that subtract from normal behavior and that would be withdrawal from social isolation deterioration of hygiene school performance detachment towards life those are considered the negative symptoms or the subtraction from normal it's kind of a weird way to describe it because obviously all these symptoms are are bad i don't i don't want any of them it's more like this is added to normal behavior and this is detracting from normal behavior. And the problem is it's much easier for in schizophrenia to treat the positive symptoms or the psychotic symptoms. It's not easy to treat the negative symptoms. And so there will be compliance issues for many schizophrenic patients because when they take the medicine, they don't feel good. When they're not taking the medicine, they're obviously a danger to people, themselves and others, and they will have a hard time functioning in the world, but they don't feel like they're abnormal, so it doesn't really bother them the same way. 
So there can be a compliance issue with schizophrenic medicines. So the first group of medications that could be used for psychosis in and of itself or could be used to treat schizophrenia are um, phenothiazines. These are also dopamine receptors. These are dopamine receptor antagonists. So if we talked about dopamine receptor agonists when we talked about Parkinson's disease because those medications helped increase available dopamine because Parkinson's symptoms are related to a decrease in dopamine. So if now the psychosis is thought to be related to an imbalance or too much dopamine, this medication is going to block dopamine's effects. So one of their main side effects is actually Parkinson's-like symptoms, which is what EPS means. It stands for extra parameterable symptoms, but that really means that the patient will start to have those tremors, they might have dyskinesias too, like people who use medications for Parkinson's. They might have rigid muscles um, and changes in their posture. So all the things that people with Parkinson's have is potentially a possibility for these people. It is good at controlling mania and it's good at controlling those positive or psychotic symptoms, but it is less good at helping the negative symptoms or the social withdrawal deterioration of care for yourself. Um, issues with side effects, some degree of dizziness, drowsiness, and potential orthostatic hypotension. Um, the adverse effect is hypertension and fever. People taking phenothalazines have a harder time dissipating heat, um, so they they do, don't do as well in really extreme temperatures, especially the, um, obviously the hotter temperatures or if they're sick. Um, and they are, if they develop any kind of fever or headache, they need their blood pressure checked because they could be in a hypertensive crisis. And that's what neuroleptic malignant syndrome is. When so, I was what? taking an ATI exam, I remember seeing a question about what medication you would give to treat the Parkin Parkinsonism that you would see from this medication. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to know that for your exam? No. Do you remember what they said to take? No, I do not. <laughs> they're, um, they're actually like sedative type medications. You're trying to relax the muscles for some of them. Um, but you don't have to worry about that for our exam. Um, all the antipsychotics, just like we were talking about, have the risk of these Parkinson's-like issues. And there might not be anything that can be done about it. They just have to deal with it, especially these tardive dyskinesias. The same things that we had when the person was taking medication for Parkinson's too, which is that lip smacking, tongue rolling, eyes excessively blinking, head bobbing. You know, the, so then you you'll start to notice. You should kind of look around when you're in the community, especially if like you're. Well, it's hard. No one's going outside that much anymore, but. Sometimes I'll notice, like, I'll be sitting at a coffee shop or something, you're like, oh, that person must be on something because their tongue is sticking out all the time or whatever. So for these adverse effects for these antipsychotics, let's just say they do have um, any of those symptoms, is that just so we don't recommend that they try a different med? Like, it just kind of comes with it and you have to be on it? Or Yeah, so – the... oh, go ahead. I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just asking because, like, a lot of the when we say adverse effects for like hypertension, mm -hmm. we usually recommend that they would see somebody so that because maybe that medication is not, um, you know, good for them. But this is just a this kind of comes with it. Well, they could try they could try a different one. Okay, but um, like they're limited. They're limited. Okay. 
So you can try to give medications to ease some of the symptoms. You could try a different antipsychotic and and see if that is better for the patient. Um, but sometimes there isn't anything better and they're kind of stuck with them. Okay. Dystonia is one where the muscles like lock and they they can't take this medication anymore because their their um, their body might like remain twisted like their neck gets stuck stuff like that so you can't that kind of thing you'd have to stop taking it but increased tremors or these this weird dyskinesias you they're very upsetting to people so you try to change the or modify the medications but sometimes you can't get rid of it okay thank you sure and so that's really what the any development in the psycho, antipsychotics was like. Okay, these phenylzines, they're helping the psychotic symptoms, but there's they're difficult to take. The patients have all these extra adverse effects, these other tremors and things, and then we don't help their negative s- symptoms. So, what else can we give these patients? And so, non-phenothiazines are sometimes an option, especially if the patient is experiencing those Parkinson's-like symptoms, because this has less sedation and hypotension, which was our side effects, and they're less likely, they could still have them, but it's not as common for them to have the Parkinson's-like symptoms or the dyskinesia, so that might be an option. And then that neurolignant neuroleptic malignant syndrome where they get the fever headaches and hypertensive crisis is not as common as well so that maybe they just need to try a different one Um, there are other atypical ones that they could also try and these ones I have noticed are also used for like I've seen a lot of people placed where we used to give held a lot more when I first started as a nurse. I see people using Risperidol and Seroquel for ICU psychosis or psychosis developed from long-term hospitalization, um, not just schizophrenia. And I've seen um, Abilify, Seroquel, Geodon, Risperidol, those used very often for people with who need mood stabilization, like with bipolar disorder. So you'll see them for other things. Um, Our prototype is Risperidone or Risperidol, and this is the type of medications that people use more often for psychosis, especially without schizophrenia, because it's, it's also a dopamine receptor antagonist, but it's a little bit weaker, so they tend to have less of the some of the symptoms um, that we don't like and they can have a reduction of both the positive and negative behaviors associated with schizophrenia so they will have they won't socially withdraw they'll be able to take care of themselves they won't have like this crippling depression and they'll also have a decrease in the mania and um, psychotic behaviors so we still have the possibility of fever, orthostatic hypotension, and maybe some dyskinesias. But overall, these medications are much more well tolerated than the original ones. This is the big issue, however, and this is always the question. People can gain a lot of weight on these medicines and not, I mean, not just a little weight. I have seen people who have taken Seroquel, um, you know, for a hospitalized patient, that's probably okay because anyone sick enough to become psychotic has probably lost weight in the hospital. But I've seen people lose 60 or gain 60 pounds in like a month. I mean, this is significant weight gain. And if they're diabetic, especially, it can really bring their blood sugar up. So anyone on these medications long term will need to talk to nutritionists, they'll need to talk to you about proper dietary choices to decrease the possibility of hyperglycemia and weight gain, because that is the biggest issue. No, it sounds like it would be a good idea, but they don't usually treat, um, you can use medications that stimulate appetite, which we'll talk about in the GI section, Scott. 
some medications like Megase and things like that, which make people hungrier. But usually the people who have these, have anorexia, they don't, they just, it's all about behavior modification. It doesn't even matter if you try to make them more hungry. They're just not going to eat. So usually, it usually is, ends up being a, a lot of intensive talk therapy. Couldn't uh, anorexia or bulimia be considered a negative behavior of certain psychosis or certain... Um, anorexia, probably. Bulimia is a little... Um, the eating disorders, some of those, like bulimia, are a little bit different because they eat and then puke, so it's a little bit a little bit different. But that does sometimes go... It's certainly abnormal thinking. Most people who have anorexia or bulimia, when they look in the mirror, do not see what everyone else sees. So there's definitely, like, body dysmorphia and a different perception, but it's not completely like psychosis because it's just with body image. So that's all the medications. So there are quite a few. Um, if you look at the study guide, I just want to be sure there was a couple of versions of the study guide, so I just want to be sure. Damn it. This isn't the... I knew... I, I'm glad I checked. That's not the correct study guide, so I'll, I will correct that because it has to have the migraine medications on it as well as um, the medications, um, the autonomic nervous medications, the seizure medications, neurodegenerative medicines, and behavioral health medicines. So... If you printed the study guide off already, get rid of it because that's the wrong one. I did that to the other class too. I just want to be sure that you have the right study guide. Um, does anyone have any questions about the coming exam? You can certainly email me if you do. Um, and again, do neuro part two with a score of 85% or greater. That should be uploaded. And then the exam starts at 9 o'clock and goes till 10.45. Um, so email with me if you need anything. I will um, see you guys next week. Have a good week.